everyone. I, sh I should say, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're well. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, I'm going to get started here. So one minute, let's push that button. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're well. It's Rabbi Akiva Males, and it, we're getting ready for Parshas Miketz, as well as Shabbos Hanukkah. So it's a pleasure to share Divrei Torah with you. I'm looking forward to sharing some Divrei Torah with you that relate to both Parshas Miketz and to Hanukkah. So let's jump right in. There is a lot that goes on in Parshas Miketz. So in Parshas Miketz, remember, just we're in the middle of the story of Yosef and his brothers. We know that Yosef has been sold in last week's Parsha as a slave. He has found himself down in Mitzrayim. And the Parsha begins where we left off last week, that he is in prison. And Paro, at the beginning of this week's Parsha, has a dream, two dreams, actually, because it's a repetitive dream. And it's bothering him to no end. He cannot find any interpretations that satisfy him. And the Sar Hamashkim, the butler who had been in jail previously with Yosef, puts in a word of recommendation finally for Yosef. Yosef had asked him to do this much earlier, two years prior, but he did not do that. It does not happen until this week's Parsha. So let's jump right in. In Perak Mem Aleph 41, by Dabir Sar Hamashkim as Paro Lemor. So the butler was the, he, he spoke up to Paro and he says as follows. Today I'm going to recall my previous sins. Yud, 10. Paro katsafal avadav. A while ago, Paro got very upset at his servants. I was placed into the jail that was under the control of the sar hatabachim, the chief slaughterer or executioner, depending on how that's understood. And that was potifar. And remember, it was a so I was put into prison along with the chief baker. It was not just me. It was the chief baker and the butler. We were both put in jail. Yud Aleph, 11. And one night, the two of us had a dream. We each had our own dreams while we were in prison. It happened the same night. And each one of us, we had an interpretation of the dream of the other. That's the way the commentaries explained that. That was the way that they knew that Yosef was on target with the interpretations because each one had their own individual dream as well as having dreamt the interpretation of their friend's dream. So when Yosef comes forward and offers an interpretation, that's how they know he's on the money. Yud Beis, 12. Bishami Tanu, in prison with us. Nar Ivri, there was a young Hebrew lad, Eved Lesara Tabachim. He was actually a slave or a servant of the Sara Tabachim, the chief slaughterer or executioner, uh, who, who was in charge of that prison. He was a slave of Potiphar. And we decided to tell that stuff, our dreams to Yosef. And amazingly, he was on the ball. He, he provided interpretations for our dreams. Each one of us, he interpreted according to his dream. Yud Gimel, 13. And it was exactly what he interpreted for each one of us, Kain Haya. That's exactly how it played out. And I have it bolded here. What was the interpretation? And how did Yosef predict what our dreams were telling us? I was going to be restored to my original position. And the other fellow, meaning the baker, Tala, he was hanged. That's how Yosef said that's the interpretation of our dreams. And it's exactly what happened. So he's telling Paro, you're looking for an interpreter of dreams. Have I got the guy for you? And he's going through his contact list and he gives him Yosef's information. Yudalad 14. So Paro sends a message to the person in charge of that prison, get me this Yosef character. They hastily, they rush him out of the pit. Why is it called the pit or the dungeon? Back in the days of yore, jails were oftentimes underground. That's a dungeon. They were subterranean. So that's where Yosef was. By Galach, they gave him a haircut. They shaved him. By Chalef Simlaso, they changed his clothes. He must have stank spending all that time down there in the jail. By Yavoel Paro. And now that he's presentable, now he comes to Paro. That's how Yosef makes, uh, this is a momentous event in his life. And this is where Yosef, uh, everything starts to turn around for him. His fortune begins to change. 
Now, I want to take a look back at the end of last week's Parsha in Vayeshev, and let's take a look at what exactly, according to Chazal, what did the baker and the butler do wrong? The Torah does not tell us what exactly their crime was. All the Torah tells us, as we'll see in this Pasuk, that well, you see it's, we're rewinding, it's going back to chapter 40, Parak Mem, Pasuk Aleph. Vayacharet Vorimaela, it was after these events, after Yosef was in jail, Chatu Mashke Melech Mitzrayim Ve'ofa, the chief butler and the chief baker, they sinned against the king of Egypt. La Doneim, they sinned against their, their master, Melech Mitzrayim, who was the ruler of Egypt, the king of Egypt. Now the Pasuk, the verse does not tell us what exactly their sin was. Rashi, however, quoting the Medrash, tells us that our Chazal, our sages, had a tradition exactly what they did wrong. Rashi says, Chatu, what does it mean that they did something wrong, they sinned? Zenim says, Zavuv bepaile potirun shalo. This one, meaning the butler, the cupbearer, he, a fly was found in the goblet, meaning the, the big coast, the big goblet of Paro, his wine cup that was brought to him, there was a big, fat, hairy fly doing the backstroke in that goblet. And the other one, the baker, what did he do wrong? A pebble, a tsuror was found in the bread that was served to the king. So each one of them did something wrong. They were, it was under their watch. The cupbearer, the butler, he's supposed to make certain that Paro is getting nothing but the finest quality. And the baker is also supposed to make sure that the bread that's put on the table of Paro is the finest quality. And lo and behold, there's a rock, there's a pebble in Paro's bread. Lo and behold, there's a nasty fly in Paro's goblet. And for that, they are each put in jail. Okay, so we know, according to Chazal, what they've done wrong. And we also know their punishment. We know that the butler got his job back after spending some time in prison. And we know that the baker was executed. He was hanged for this. I saw the most incredible, I love this, I saw the most incredible interpretation, a question and an answer in the most unlikely source. And this was something offered by Rabbi Yechiel Michal Alevi Epstein. He's oftentimes called, I've got a brief bio there, he primarily lived in the 1800s, in the 19th century. He was a towering figure of halachic ruling in Eastern Europe. He's oftentimes called the Aruch HaSholchan. That was his main halachic work, the Aruch, as opposed to the Sholchan Aruch. So that was written hundreds of years earlier. So Rev, Rev Yechiel Michal Alevi Epstein wrote a commentary that incorporated all the commentary that had been written on the Sholchan Aruch and brought down how he thinks we should rule. So the Aruch HaSholchan was a, a big halachic authority in the 19th century in Europe. He was a rabbi in Posek, authority of Jewish law in Lithuania. Now his son we've quoted many times in recent weeks. His son was Rabbi Baruch HaLevi Epstein, who wrote the Torah Tamima commentary, as well as the Tosef Espracha that we've been enjoying sharing in Shiurim in our classes of late. So here we're going to see something from his father in the most unlikely of sources, because Rabbi Yechiel Mechel HaLevi Epstein is primarily known for his halachic works, for the Aruch HaSholchan. Yet he also authored a work on the Pesach Haggadah, that, that And I have it here, I have it at home a couple of years ago. It was called Leil, Shim, Leil Shimurim, <clears throat> The Night of Watching. And I'm so excited to receive it. A couple of years ago, I bought it when it came out in a new typeface because I had seen it in the old original typeface earlier. And it was just very hard to read. The paragraphs were, weren't always broken up into readable chunks and the font wasn't so good. A couple of years ago, as they're doing with many Sfarim in Israel, they reprinted it with such a readable text. And you see it there, I scanned it in. It was beautiful how they did this. So I, I bought it and I saw such a gem there and I wanna share it with you. Such an unlikely place. We're gonna find a commentary to the story of the butler and the baker, where? In the Pesach Haggadah, in the commentary on the Pesach Haggadah. If I wouldn't have seen this, I would never have known it existed. Who thinks to look in a Pesach Haggadah to find a good shot, a good commentary on the story of the butler and the baker in Parshas Vayeshev and Miketz? I never would have thought it, but I found it, so I want to share it with you. So here's what we dug up. So this is the middle of a much longer piece. He's in the middle of Manishtana, in the middle of a much longer piece. I found this gem. Let me share it with you. So I'm on the right column. inyan saramashkim. I want to explain my take on the Saramashkim, the butler, in the story of the dreams, who first met Yosef, and then is the one who advises Paro to ask for Yosef's interpretations. Here's my take on the Saramashkim. Lechora mishpat Paro, he goes, it seems to me 
that the ruling, the verdict that Paro issued, Lahashiv Saramashkim al Mechono, to give the Saramashkim, to give the butler his job back, Visara o Fimtala, and he decreed that the baker should get hanged, who Mishpat Hafuch. That seems to be the exact opposite of what I would have ruled. That doesn't make sense. He goes, look what their crimes were. Lafimasha Perish Rashi, according to the way Rashi explained what their crimes were, Shechet Saramashkim Haya, what was the sin of the butler? that a nasty fly was found in the goblet of the king. What was the sin? What was the wrongdoing of the baker? That either a wood chip or a pebble was found in the, in the loaf of bread. If that's what happened, it would seem to me that the crime of the butler was far greater than what the baker did. The goblet that had the big fly doing the backstroke, that was placed directly into the hand of Paro, that he's going to drink from it. But the baker didn't put the loaf of bread into the king's hand. It's put on the table. It gets sliced up. It gets sliced up. It's in a bread basket. And, and who knows? that? Who's to say that the, bread's, the king's going to eat from the slice of bread that's got the pebble in it? But he's going to drink from that cup of wine that has the fly doing the backstroke in it. It's more likely that he's going to consume something nasty from what the butler gave him rather than what the baker gave him. So why is it that the baker gets sentenced to death and the butler gets his job back? Again, just to continue reading. How could Paro, who seems to have been a logical fellow, why would he give such a backward verdict? He says, I also have another question. How do you explain how such a mess up happens at the same time? Tell me that in January, the butler had a mistake. And then in, in March, the baker has a mistake. That's more likely. But to tell me at the same event, under the same, uh, same short uh, amount of time, both the butler and the baker had, had this mess up. Hello, Devaru. Come on, that sounds astonishing. These are the questions of the Aruch HaShulchan. He's got two questions on the episode of the butler and the baker. Number one, according to Rashi's interpretation, which is Chazal, it's not just Rashi, it's what the Medrash says, what our sages tell us in the Medrash. He says, I've got two questions. Number one, what's the odds of this, both of these events happening at the same time? And number two, it seems to me that the punishments should have been reversed. The butler is the one who should have been executed. The baker is the one who should have gotten his job back. So now in our Parsha, in Mikates, when the butler is retelling the event, why is he saying, yeah, yeah, Yosef was on the money, I got my job back, and the butler, the baker got hanged. It should have been the opposite. How do we explain this? So look at the next column. This is where Rabbi Epstein offers a theory, an incredible theory. I love it. Let's see it on the left column. L'chen, therefore, libi omerli, my heart tells me. In other words, here's my intuition. I'm going to propose a theory that can explain this. The Indian Kachaya, this is how to explain what happened here. Shishnea Sarima these two officers, the butler and the baker, they hated each other. They were enemies. Each one wanted to cause the other one to trip up. So he would become putrid. So he would become hated in the eyes of Paro. Each one wanted to get the other one fired. Now, again, in the world of dealing with a monarch, you don't just get fired, you get your head handed to you. So the butler hates the baker. The baker hates the butler. And they're both trying to think, how can I sabotage the other so he gets fired and gets himself in real trouble? So what did the, what did the butler do? He took the kisem, he took the wood chip or the pebble, and he stuck it into the loaf of bread before it went in the oven because he was trying to frame, he was trying to sabotage the baker. The Sarah Ophim, and what did the baker do? The exact opposite. He intentionally took a big, hairy, nasty fly, and he put it into the cup of paro, because he was trying to mess up, he was trying to frame, he was trying to sabotage the butler. So it comes out, if that's what happened, the main sin, really, what did they both do wrong? That each one was trying to take revenge, was trying to punish the other. Using the king, each one was using the king 
to try to ruin their friend's career and their lives. Therefore, the sin of the baker, now it's understandable why the sin of the baker was greater than the sin of the butler. It was intentional, and it was each one framing the other. Shesara Ofim Hayes Panov. What did the baker do that was so much chutzpah? Lahatil Zavuv because Hanitin Al Yara Melach. He had the chutzpah to put that nasty fly into the goblet that would be handed directly into the hand of the king, where it was most likely that he would consume it. Lafikach Dandino Lamisa. That's why the baker was said, You're going, you're going to hang. Mashiach and Sarah now we can understand why the butler's crime order wasn't that bad. So what did he do? I and mean, it was bad. He deserved this time in prison, but it wasn't a death sentence. Chetel kisem He put either the wood chip or the pebble into the loaf of bread, trying to frame the baker. And the bread isn't directly, the loaf of bread when it's brought to the table isn't put directly into the king's hand. It's not like it was like a bun that he was going to eat it with his hamburger. It was put on the table. It was a, it was a big loaf to be cut up. Maybe the king would never end up with that slice that had the wood chip or the pebble in it. Therefore, when the king found out what happened, that each one did this intentionally, he decided to give, after spending time in prison, he decided to give the butler his job back. Because although he did a crime and he deserved to spend some time in jail for, for uh, you know, messing with the king and using the king in this way to, take, uh, to sabotage his, his, the other officer, at the end of the day, it wasn't as much chutzpah. So the king decided to give him a second chance after spending time in jail. But the butler, yeah, he did time. He spent his time in jail. But at the same token, it was so much more chutzpah because by planting that fly in the goblet of the king, it was more likely he would consume that. That's a much bigger crime, a much bigger um, uh, sin against the crown. And therefore, he was sentenced to death. I thought this is incredible. It just adds... First of all, it adds more to the story of the butler and the baker because it explains, come on, how likely is it for these two mistakes to happen at the same time? It wasn't a mistake. It was direct attempt, each one trying to frame, sabotage the other. And how do you explain the fact that the punishment seems to be reversed? Logic would say the worst crime was with the fly. So why did the, the butler get his a second chance? The, the, the lesser crime was the, the baker's with the bread. So why did the baker get the death sentence? According to the Aruch HaShulchan's theory, though, it was no mistake. It was intentional. Each one was trying to frame the other. So now it comes out that, yeah, what the, what the butler did was a punishable offense, and he deserved to spend time in jail, but the king gave him a second chance because it wasn't as bad as what the baker did. The baker, not only did he deserve the time in jail, but he gets the death sentence because he the way he tried to frame the butler was in a way that almost guaranteed that the king would end up drinking that nasty fly. That's why he got the worst sentence there. I thought this was an incredible shot. This is a, it's, a, it's an incredible theory to try to explain and to make sense of this verdict that was handed down on the baker and on the butler. And also to explain just a more backstory. How does it make sense that this, 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 these random events, what's the odds of both of these happening at the same time? Because it wasn't a mistake. It was intentional sabotage, each one out to get the other. I thought this was an incredible shot. Now, truth be told, again, I said this was in a commentary on the Pesach Haggadah, on Manishtana, so Rabbi Yechiel Michal Epstein now uses this as part of a, a, a much larger um, uh, routine to say something larger that related to the Pesach Haggadah. So what we did is we extracted this one nugget that in its own right is, is awesome to say, uh, to say over a pshat, to say over an interpretation of the story of the butler and the baker. But what Yechiel Michal Epstein does with this, he, he does more with it to, to find a way to, to make this work into something he was saying in the Pesach Haggadah. But just extracting this one piece offers us an incredible insight, an incredible theory, I should say, to make sense of the incident of the Sar HaMashkim and the Sarah Open, the, the butler and the baker in the story of Yosef and Paro, this, this adds a, a whole new dimension to it. It makes more sense of it. Okay, that was number one. Now I want to share with you two very important commentaries from the Ramban, from Nachmanides, that I think is really crucial for everyone. As we learn Parshas Miketz, he addresses two points that are really, I would say, questions that have to be dealt with in the next parak, in parak Mem Beis, in chapter 42. Now, without seeing these two commentaries of the Ramban, uh, someone's, someone's understanding of the Parsha will really not be as enriched. So I want to share this with you. You may know these, you may have seen these, you may have studied these before, but it's always worthy to review them. 
And if you haven't seen them before, I think it's it's important to know them. So let's check out um, Perak Membez. Perak Membez, what has happened uh, at, at this point is that the famine has increased. And now Yaakov realizes we, we've got to uh, start sending people down to Egypt to get food. That's what all the locals are doing. That's what we should do too. So let's see, Aleph. Yaakov sees, he hears, he understands that there's food being sold in Egypt because again, the famine has hit the whole region. So Yaakov says to the sons, why, literally, why are you making yourselves seen? We'll see soon. We're going to get there. It's after the Rambans, uh, the, the, what the interpretation of that is. We'll come back to that. So Yaakov says, there's good reason. We've got to go down to Egypt. Base. I have heard that there's food, there's grains being sold in Egypt. Redu Shama, I want you to go down there. And by doing that, you'll buy some grains for us. That'll enable us to live, to make it through this famine, and we won't die of hunger. Gimel, three. So 10 brothers go down. Remember, there are 12 boys. So 10. Now, Yosef's obviously not going because he's already in Egypt. So 10 of the 11 that are left go down the Shpor Bar Mitzram to buy food. So who's the 11th who did not go? Dalit, four. That's Binyamin Achi Yosef, Lo Shalach Yaakov Etzachim. So Binyamin is the brother of Yosef. Yaakov did not send him along with the other brothers. Why? Ki Amar Pani son. He was worried some misfortune should befall fall him. He's all I've got left of my beloved wife, Ra, 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 my beloved wife, Rachel. I had two sons with her. I had Yosef and I had Binyamin. Yosef's gone. All I have left is Binyamin. And, and if, if he were to something go wrong with him, I'd be crushed. So that's that's the one thing I have, the memory of my beloved wife. I can't send Binyamin. So 10 sons go down to Egypt. Hey, five. So the brothers of Yosef, they mix in the lines amongst all the others from the regions who have come down there. And uh, they're, they, they kind of sneak into the line. They kind of in, inconspicuously, they don't go together to commentary, say they kind of find themselves in the line with everybody else. Kiyaya, Rav, Beretz, Kanad. There were many people coming down to Canaan because it's down to Egypt because the famine had extended and reached into Canaan as well. Vav, the Yosef who has shalit our arts. Now let's remember Yosef's position. He was in a position of rulership over the land of Egypt. Hu Hamashbir, I've got a bolded. Hu Hamashbir, Lechol Amaretz. He was the provider. He was the one who was selling uh, a food, a grain, to, to all of the people of the land. Uh, I remember in Israel, there was a big department store near the central bus station in Jerusalem. It was called Hamashbir. You know, that's the, I guess, the place where that provides, you know, that sells. And I thought it was always so cool is that, you know, that, that's, that's taken right from Tanakh. And it's saying about Yosef, that Yosef was the ultimate. I guess you might say he was the first Jewish department store owner. That here was Yosef. He was the mashbir. He was the provider. He was the, he was the one, the purveyor of goods, of, of food for all of Egypt. So the brothers of Yosef come together with everyone else from Canaan. And they prostrate themselves. They bow, bow down fully with their faces to the ground. We're going to see something on this, a Ramban, an important Ramban on that passage. Soon, let's just see three more verses. Zion. So Yosef immediately sees his brothers and he recognizes him. But he disguised himself. He made himself a stranger to them. And he starts speaking rather harshly to them. Where have you come from? We came from the land of Canaan to purchase food. Ches. Eight. Vayakir Yosef HaSachav. Yosef clearly recognizes his brothers, but they couldn't recognize him. Test nine. I've got this bolded. We're going to see a Ramban on that too. At that point, Yosef remembers the dreams, those two dreams. Number one, about the sun and stars bowing to him. Number two, I might have had that out of order, about the, the sheaves of wheat bowing to him. And Yosef says to them, You guys are spies. When you are just here, you want to spot out what are the weak points of the land because you want to come and attack from Canaan. That's what Yosef says. We're going to see two very important um, ideas from the Ramban. Let's first see the first Ramban is going on Pasuk Vav, where it says about Yosef. Yosef was the shalit, he was the ruler, and he had another hat he wore. Aside from being the ultimate ruler, he also was the mashbir. He was the purveyor of food for all of Egypt. So look at the Ramban. He asks a very logical question. 
So Ramban, I'm on the next page here, it's page four. Ramban says, he was the purveyor for all the people of the land. He was the one selling the food. He goes, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. Yosef is the shalit, as the Pasuk said. He's the ruler of the land. He's the viceroy. He's second in charge to the king of all of Egypt. It doesn't make sense that he's mocher l'chol echad sa'a or terkav minatua. Does that make sense to you? That the imagine this, you've got the president of the country is going to be standing at the food bank uh, and, and selling um, either a, a package or a couple packages of food to everyone who comes in. He appoints ministers for this. You appoint deputies. He doesn't do this. He's important. He's involved with meeting with, uh, you know, senators, congressmen, deputies who are coming from all over the world. Why is Yosef? The puzzle guy clearly identifies him as he's the shalit. And then it says he's also the mashbir al cholamarts. He's the guy selling food. He says, "How do you explain this? It, why would he be doing this?" So he says, "Therefore, he's going to say two explanations." But this is the problem. He says, "You can't read this pasuk and avoid this this question. You have to deal with this question." Rabban says, "If he's the shalit, why is he managing the cash register? It doesn't make sense." Our sages in the medrash were bothered by this, and therefore they suggested as follows. Shetziva listom kola otsros, that Yos, they, Yosef knows the famine is extended into Canaan, and it's only a matter of time till people from Canaan, including his own family, are going to start coming down. And he wants to make sure they don't come to Egypt and miss him. He wants to get them when they're there. He wants to see them. He wants to put them through this ordeal. So what does he do? He gives the, he issues the following command. There are many storehouses of food in Egypt. Shut them all down. There's only going to be one open. And I'm going to be there. So he gave Shetziva Listom Kola Otsros. He put in a command, shut down all the granaries that are selling produce. Chutz Me'echad Be'esahi. At that time, when he heard that the famine had reached Canaan and people are starting to come from Canaan, he said, just leave one open. And I want to see everyone who comes through because this is going to be his opportunity to be able to confront the brothers and set up this ordeal that he wants to put into motion. So that's what the sages say in the Medrash to explain this. Because otherwise, why would it make sense? Why would Yosef be at the cash register? So they say it was a deliberate attempt. He shut down every one of the, the storehouses in order because he wanted to, 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 to set up this ordeal. That's what he says the sages say in the Medrash. Now the Ramban says, Valderach Pshat. I want to offer another idea that I think is more along the lines of a plain reading of the Pesukim. Look what he says. Yitachen, it's possible. Shayu boim lefanav mikol aratzos. Is you know what? All the locals, they could go, the locals could go to all the storehouses, but they had one storehouse that was specifically set up for foreigners. And that in that storehouse, all the foreigners, um, uh, representatives from every foreign land and state in the area, they would come there uh, as ambassadors of their region to bring back. And who was the one who managed that storehouse? Because that involves a lot of chachma. You have to decide how much do you want to send to different lands, to different countries? Are they allies? Do I want to make friendships? Do I want to make diploma, diplomatic maneuvers? That one, Yosef was in charge of. So here's what he says. Valderach hapshat. He says, here's a plain, uh, what I think an idea that fits with the plain reading of the Pesukim. Yosef did not shut down all the other warehouses. They were open for locals, for Egyptians. Itaken shahayu baim lefanav mikol aratzos that Yosef put a rule in the play that if you're a foreigner coming in, you got to come before me. He would ask and see where are you coming from? How many people are you providing for? What do you need? And he would give out orders to his officers, to his deputies. Okay, we've got a representative here from, from a certain land, let's say from Ethiopia. This is how much to sell him. So much grain, this type of grain. Now, since B'nai Yaakov, the children of Yaakov, they were foreigners. They were not Egyptians. They don't have Egyptian passports. They're coming in as foreigners from Canaan. They would, if, if Yosef set up the system that every foreigner has to come before me, because there's a lot of cheshbonos, there's a lot of calculations as far as how much grain gets sold to foreign lands. Now it makes sense. You got to come before me, come before Yosef. So now it makes sense. 
the Pasuk said that they got in line with Socha Boimeret's Canaan. They got in line with the other people who were coming from Canaan. Yosef set up a system, a very efficient system, because he, he can't be in all places. It's not going to be efficient to shut down every warehouse. The entire land of Egypt needs food. So I'm, I'm going to shut down every warehouse and just leave one open. Can you imagine what the lines would be? So he said all the warehouses stay open for the locals. And you know what? You might even have warehouses open for foreigners of different lands. But there's going to be one warehouse that's open, you know, for or one department in that warehouse that's for the Canaan section, and that's where Yosef positioned himself. So he says, So the brothers had to get in line along with the people who were coming from Canaan, Canaan, because this Egyptian ruler, he was the one who would decide for every foreign country based on diplomatic reasoning and, and all sorts of wisdom, how much they could bring back to distribute in their lands. So the Ramban wants to put in the theory is that in fact, the brothers were from the first group that was coming from the land of Canaan. They were coming, not just representing the family of Yaakov, but representing their region. So if let's say they lived in Hebron at that time. So they were coming to represent not just uh, our family, but also the immediate uh, vicinity. We're coming on behalf of Hebron. We are ambassadors. We are diplomats on behalf of Hebron and in the land of Canaan, maybe even a larger area than that, to uh, to bring back food. And that's what we're here for. So that's the Ramban's theory. I, I, I love this because what he's doing is he's giving you a couple of ideas. He's giving you a couple of options, rather. He's bringing up a very logical question is that Yosef was all about efficiency. You could tell that from the advice he gave to Paro. Why would it make sense what he says about the Medrash? Uh, he goes, the Medrash is bothered by a very good question. Yosef is the Shalit, he's the ruler. Why would he be manning the cash register? So the Medrash had one suggestion. He shut down every other warehouse and just left one open so they'd have to come in forehead. But he, Ramban says, that's incredibly inefficient. So he says, here's what I think is a, a plain, a, a much easier interpretation to swallow, is that Yosef did not shut down every warehouse. For Mitzrayim, for the local Egyptians, they were all open. But for foreigners, there was one massive warehouse where they all had to come. And there was a section, a department in there that you'd have to come before Yosef to explain where you were coming from, how many people you're bringing back for, and he would decide what you got. And that's, that's where he positioned himself. And the brothers were coming on behalf of their region in Canaan, not just their family. So he set it up this way in a very efficient manner. This goes in sync with Yosef's uh, command and Yosef's a demand for efficiency, and this was set up in such a way to ensure that the uh, that the that things would be efficient, but at the same token, he would encounter his brothers. I think that's an awesome Ramban. It's a very good one to know. Now, I want to share with you what might perhaps be one of the most important uh, commentaries from Ramban on on the whole episode. Again, not the most, one of the most important uh, comments from Ramban. And the entire episode of Yosef and his brothers. So the Pasuk told us, Vayizkor Yosef and Pasuk Tess in verse 9, Vayizkor Yosef as a chalamos, a shir chalam lam. It says that the brothers are standing before Yosef, and all of a sudden, boom, he's got a flashback. Now he remembers the dreams that he had about him. Why, why is the Pasuk throwing that in? So let's say what the Ramban offers. Ramban says, What does it mean, chalam lam, that he dreamt about them? Aleim. And there's that he dreamt about them. The Yada, so his first shot is he's quoting Rashi, the Yada Shiniskaimu, and he knows that they were now fulfilled. Share Ishtahvu Lo Lush and Rashi. Rashi wants to say that what's shot? What does it mean that that the brothers came, they bow down to Yosef, and now he remembers the dreams? So Rashi wants to say, Ah, great, mission accomplished. Here I am, I'm the ruler, and now look at that, they bowed down to me. I had a dream, the sun and stars bowing down to me. Good, it just happened. I had a dream, the sheaves of wheat were bowing down to me. Boom, it just happened. Beautiful, that's the way Rashi learns. Ramban argues vehemently. Ulafi daiti, where it's bolded at the end of that line. Ulafi daiti, according to the way I see it, according to my knowledge, it's exactly the opposite. Au contraire, ki yomara kasuv ki baros Yosef es achav mishtachavim lo. What the pasuk is saying is that when Yosef saw the brothers bow down to him, zacher kol achalamos asher chalamlam. Now he remembers the entirety of the dreams that he had about them. V'yadan he knows shelo niskayem echad mehem the pamazos. Not a single one of the dreams have been fulfilled. It's close. I'm smelling it. We're getting close to fulfilling those dreams. 
but not a single dream has been fulfilled. Because how many bow down to him? Ten. Neither dream was fulfilled. The one dream, there was 11 sheaves of wheat bowing down to him. There's not 11 now. There's 10 bowing down to me. The other dream was the sun, the moon, and the stars. Okay, how many stars? 10 stars bowed down to me, not 11. And also no sun and moon. That's what he says, Kiyodeya Pisronam. Yosef understood the interpretation of those dreams. In the dream about the wheat bowing down to him, what's supposed to happen first is that all 11 of the brothers are supposed to bow down to him. Because remember what the dream was? That all 11 brothers are supposed to bow down to him. So that hasn't happened. 10, it's a nice start, but it hasn't happened. And in the second dream, what does that tell me? That another incident is supposed to happen, that all 11 are supposed to bow down to me. And also, the sun, meaning Yaakov, and the moon, meaning Billah, the one representing his mother, because she's no longer alive. And the 11 brothers that are in the same, they're all supposed to bow down to me. And neither of those dreams have been fulfilled with just 10 brothers bowing down to me. Since he saw Binyamin was not with him, it was just 10. So now he knows not even the first dream was fulfilled. Therefore, he says, I've got to put into play a strategy. I have to put something in place that's going to cause, number one, that they'll bring down Binyamin. So then the first dream will be fulfilled that all 11 will bow down. And then number two, that they'll come back again, but this time bring the whole family so that Yaakov and his wives will bow down as well. We've got to have that in place. Where's this all coming from? The Ramban holds, and this is so crucial to understand the whole story of Yosef, that if a Navi of, of prophet legitimately has a prophecy, it's a mitzvah, it's, it's, his, it's his command, it's his responsibility to do whatever he can to make it come to fruition. We'll see how this plays out. So look what the Ramban learns here. The Ramban continues. Again, we're in the middle of that line. We're about seven, six lines down. Since he did not see Binyamin with them, he thought up this strategy. She He'll make a libel against them that they're spies. And this way, they'll bring down on their next trip to Egypt. They'll go back. They'll put Shimon in jail. They'll go back and get Binyamin. And now they'll be together. Now all 11 can bow down. And that'll enable them to fulfill the, fulfill the first dream of the sheaves of wheat bound down to him. That's also why he didn't immediately identify himself and saying, hey, I'm Yosef, go get the whole family. Go get mom and dad, go get dad, rather. Mom's, uh, Rachel's already passed. In other words, later he's going to reveal himself. Why didn't he just do it now? Because he needs to fulfill those dreams in the proper sequence. If he would have just revealed himself now, his father would have come down in a jiffy. But I don't want dad to come down yet because I'm supposed to have the first dream happen first. That means all 11 brothers got to bow down to me first. And only after that dream is fulfilled can we move on to the second dream of the sun and the moon bowing down and then all the stars bowing down. But we first got to fulfill the first dream. If he had revealed himself, Yaakov, he would have brought everyone. Only after he's got into the first room to come to fruition, he get Only then does he reveal himself and say, I'm Yosef, I'm your brother Yosef, and now go get dad. Only then does he reveal himself because now that the first dream has been fulfilled, does he now go and reveal himself to get the second dream to come into motion? And now Rambana had something so crucial. The Lule came. If you do not say like my theory, he goes, I've just given you a theory that will explain all the behavior of Yosef. If you don't say my theory, Yosef Yosef is nothing but a tremendous sinner. To cause his father such pain, to leave his father in massive pain all for so long uh, and not letting his dad know where he is, first of all, about Shimon being jail, and then even longer about himself. This answers the million dollar question on the whole story with Yosef and the brothers. Why did Yosef never send the postcard home once he got out of jail? Okay, while he's a slave, he can't do it. While he's in jail, he can't do it. But as soon as he gets appointed to a position of prominence, why didn't he send a postcard to Canaan and say, dad, it's me. I'm, I'm the second in charge in Egypt. Get the whole family. If you don't say like the Ramban, Yosef is causing his father a tremendous amount of pain. 
What the Ramban is saying, though, is here's my explanation for this. You know why he never sent that postcard? Yeah, that would have gotten his dad, it would have relieved him, but then he didn't fulfill his prophecies. And as a Navi, as a prophet, his responsibility, this is Ramban's shita, this is his position throughout this story. As a prophet, his responsibility is to bring his prophecies to fruition. And that's why Yosef did not send the postcard home uh, years earlier. And that's why he let this, uh, this alila, this libel, that's why he put it all into place, this whole strategy, because he had to bring these two dreams to fruition. So he ends by saying, Yosef knew exactly what he was doing, everything at the right time, in order to fulfill the dreams, bring them to fruition. He knows it's his responsibility to fulfill them in integrity. That's a crucial Ramban. I think that's one of the most important Rambans in the whole story of Mechiras Yosef that'll uh, lend some understanding to this. I think that's a, an important Ramban. That's a fundamental Ramban that anyone who's learning the story of Yosef and the brothers has to be aware of. And or, or otherwise there's just too many questions that need to be resolved. And again, are there other approaches? There are, but it's important to know this one from one of our great Rishonim. Okay, one more thing I wanna share that has to do with Hanukkah. I said at the beginning of this parak in Membez, the first Pasuk I said, we'll come back to it. And here's where we're coming back to it. It says, Vayar Yaakov ki Yaakov saw that there was food, there was grain being sold in Egypt. You see the root shever is the same as the word hamashbir, that Yosef was the purveyor, the one selling food to all of Egypt. So again, that same word shever could mean grain, it could mean being sold. So that's why they translate it as grain being sold. Vayomer Yaakov lebanav, lama tisra'u, why do you appear satiated? What does that mean? So Rashi quotes here, what our Chazal, what our sages tell us in the Gemara, in Tanis. The Gemara says, Lama tiru atzmechem, why are you letting yourselves be seen bifnei b'nei Yishmael b'nei Esav, before your cousins, the descendant of Yishmael and Esav, ki'ilu atem sveim, as if you're full, as if you don't have any problem. Shiba'os HaShah, at that time, adayin ha'ilam tivua. Yaakov's family still had food at this time. So what the Gemara is telling us is as follows. Yaakov said to the bo- to his sons, boys, this is not good form. This is really not strategic what's going on. We right now have a strategic reserve. We have enough grain to get us, I don't know how long, to get us through the next stretch. However, all of our neighbors are famishing. All of our neighbors are starving. And they're saying woes to me and they're sending trains, they're sending caravans down to Egypt to go buy food. If we don't do that, Everyone's going to be looking at us and saying, what's going on? We're all suffering. And those Hebes, that family of Yaakov, they're, pro- they're still doing okay. It's going to breed resentment. It's not smart. That's not a good way to conduct ourselves. Lama tisra'u. Why are you allowing yourselves to be seen to appear satiated? You're, you're going to uh, invoke feelings of jealousy. People are going to despise you. That's not smart. That's what Yaakov was telling to the brothers. Many of our commentators over the years said this is such an important principle that we all have to live by, is that we have to recognize, especially when we're living outside the land of Israel, it's one thing It's one thing when we're living just amongst Jews. It's also not wise to wear our success on our sleeves and to flaunt our success and our blessings, because why should we make anybody else jealous? Lama Tisro, that advice of Yaakov should apply there. But especially when we're living in the midst, we're not living in our own land, where we're living amongst people. Some of them are wonderful neighbors, but there's a lot of resentment that's buried not far beneath the surface. We don't have to look so hard to know that anti-Semitism is real, and we don't have to look so hard to know that there are people out there who are ready to cast very harmful glances on Jews and the Jewish community. If that's the case, why do we want to live large? Why do we want to be showy? Why do we want to show off our affluence, our success? It's not smart. That's what Yaakov was telling B'nai Yisrael. And many of our leaders throughout the generations have tried to drive this lesson into our heads. Some of us as individuals, some of us have as communities at different points in our lives, different points of history. We've been more seicheldic. We've had more common sense about this than at other times. And some, some people still have a lot to learn but it's such a crucial lesson that we all needed to, to, to get into our kish because it's always better to fly under the radar screen. It's not good to attract attention to ourselves. Good things don't come from that. And that's what Yaakov was telling the boys. I want to end by sharing with you an amazing article I chanced upon this week. This is from 2008. So this is about 13 uh, years ago. 
And this was from the Jewish Observer. The Jewish Observer was a magazine that was printed for years by Aguda, Aguda Sisral. And this has an article, it was based on a lecture by Rav Palm. Rav Palm was a tzaddik. He was a late Rosh Yeshiva. He headed the Yeshiva Torah Vedas in Brooklyn, New York for many years. Uh, my father-in-law, Zechron Lebracha, was privileged to have him as his Rebbe for a number of years when he was in yeshiva, both in high school and base medrash. He caught the great fortune of Rev the administration was moving Rav Palm up uh, for a couple of years in a row. Okay, you taught that grade, now move up to the next grade, to the next level, to the next level. It coincided with when my father-in-law was in his shir, so he got to have Rav Palm as his Rebbe for several years in a row, and he would speak about him. And his face would glow just talking about Rav Palm. He, he had a tremendous reverence, but not just reverence, a tremendous love for him. So I saw, here's just one short article. I want to read it to you. It, if, 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 if you don't have time, it's here and print it out, but I want to just read it to you. This is an incredible idea. Let's just see what this is. It's Hama Hanukkah. It's called, Please Keep the Shades Down. Yaakov perceived there were provisions in Egypt, and Yaakov said to his sons, why do you make yourselves conspicuous? So let's look at this together. When the years, when the seven years of abundance in Egypt ended, the years of famine began, exactly as Yosef had predicted. As the hunger intensified and spread, people from the land of Canaan journeyed to Egypt to buy food. At that time, Yaakov and his family still had food supplies available and were unaffected by the ravages of the famine. Yet, Yaakov directed his sons to join the thousands of hungry Canaanites on their trip to Egypt to buy grain. As the Gemara and Tanis describes it, Yaakov told his sons, do not show yourselves when you are satiated, not before the sons of Esav or Yishmael who are suffering from famine so that they do not become jealous of you. Rashi there says, do not appear to them like a chassan among mourners, meaning that if you're among mourners, don't come in with all the splendor of a groom. This can lead to great enmity and jealousy when they see that you have ample provisions to deal with the hunger while they are starving. Yaakov felt it was worthwhile for his sons to take the long and dangerous journey, remember this wasn't easy, to Egypt and stand in line among the peasants and paupers to buy food that at that point they did not really need. This was to avoid causing feelings of jealousy to arise among their neighbors who would see how everybody else had to go begging for food while those Jews had plenty to eat. Now listen to Rav Palm's application. Uh, this is wild. Hanukkah always occurs during the week of Parshas Mikates and Yaakov's request contains an important message relevant to this joyous festival. There is a halachic requirement of Pursume Nisa to publicize the miracle of oil. For Jews living outside of Eretz Yisrael, outside of Israel, this usually expresses itself in the menorah being placed in the front window of the home. Yet, is it necessary for the window of, uh, of the window shades, vertical blinds, curtains, etc., to be completely open to show off not only the menorah but the entire dining room or living room area? Religious Jews have a tendency to furnish these rooms in a manner that underscores their function as a setting for Seudas Mitzvah, meals where the family joins together in celebrating the fulfillment of Torah commands and festive occasions. And is it necessary that the window coverings remain open for hours after the last candle has flickered out, thereby allowing every passerby, especially non-Jews, to observe what is going on in the home and many possessions and luxuries contained therein? That is certainly not part of the mitzvah, and in fact can arouse the jealousy of others when they see how richly furnished the homes of their Jewish neighbors are. Jews must live their lives low key and not forget that even in the hospitable, comfortable atmosphere of the Medina Shel Chesed, meaning the nation of kindness, America, they are still in Gullus. When non-Jews, especially poor ones, see the relative opulence in the homes of their Jewish neighbors, it does not lead to good things. Therefore, while taking all necessary precautions to keep the menorah a safe distance from any window coverings that can catch fire, it's prudent advice that the shades be kept closed as much as possible. What, what an interesting idea. And I, 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 I never saw anyone express this before, but it's such a good idea. Again, we all know our homes, everyone's got a different type of home, but there are some homes that the, when the window is open, People are looking in and they're seeing some luxurious items. They're seeing a whole, they might see, especially if they're living like in a mixed neighborhood where people are not at that economic scale, they're living, seeing a whole different lifestyle than what they've got behind their windows. Does it make all that much sense to be showing that all off? So I'm suggesting, okay, the window, the menorah has got to be in the window. I don't know, maybe put some kind of blocker behind it or something, some way, or just don't only have it open for that half hour, whatever it is but just really give some thought as to what we want our neighbors to see. What an incredible idea. He's applying it here by Hanukkah. Okay, that's eight nights of the year.
But this really should be a lesson for us for the way we live the rest of the 365 days in the calendar is that let's go low key. Let's try to fly under the radar screen. It's never a good idea to, to, to bring attention to ourselves, especially if there's other people suffering and, and we're just not at that, at, that, at that point, thank God. Let's live lives of Lama Tisro. That's what Yaakov was cautioning the brothers. And that's what we sometimes make the mistake of forgetting, regardless of how good and how friendly the surroundings we're in, it makes sense to heed the call of Yaakov, of Lama Tisra'u, and let's make certain that we don't forget what that lesson is. Rav Pam was pointing out that it's no coincidence that that occurs on Hanukkah, and hopefully none of us will ever experience any anti-Semitism. None of us will ever experience any of that hatred, but that's certainly something which could happen. Let's be sensitive on Hanukkah, but more important, let's be insensitive at how we live our lives, both amongst our, our fellow Jews, but certainly when we're in the presence of those who aren't members of the family. All right, I'm going to uh, I'm going to stop recording and.